Michael's Mission by Rudolf Steiner, Lecture 5, Doorknock, 29th of November, 1919. The human being can only attain a true, soul-supporting consciousness by assimilating at least the most important and essential laws of human evolution. We must recognise and include in our life of soul what has taken place throughout the evolution of humanity. This is the task of human beings at the present time. As I've hinted in the last few days, this involves taking seriously the fact that as such, the evolution of humanity is a kind of living development of the human being. Just as growth takes place in the individual human being in accordance with certain laws, so it is with the evolution of the human race as a whole. In our present age, a point in time has been reached when certain things must rise up into consciousness. And during repeated lives on earth, the individual human being has participated in the various configurations of human evolutionary history. It is thus also necessary for us to develop an understanding of the various moods of soul which have prevailed in the different epochs. As I've often said, what nowadays goes by the name of history is actually no more than a fable convenu, because in all the abstract accounts about events, and in all the searching for causes and effects in the most external sense regarding historical happenings, no account at all is taken of the transformations, the metamorphoses of human soul life as such. If one were to embark on a historical investigation, one would certainly realise the degree of prejudice involved in assuming that the constitution of today's souls is more or less the same as it was back in the days covered by the earliest historical documents. But this was certainly not the case. Even the most simple and primitive human beings of the 9th or 10th post-Christian centuries had a mood of soul utterly different from the mood of those living after the middle of the 15th century. This can be investigated with regard both to the lowest and the highest echelons of humanity. You could, for example, look into Dante's extraordinary treatise, De Monachia. If you read something like this, not as a matter of curiosity, but with some degree of cultural sensitivity, you will notice how a book by a representative of that time contains things which could not possibly be expressed by the soul of a present-day person. There is just one point I want to make. In this book, which is intended as a serious treatise, from his point of view about the political basis of the monarchy, Dante endeavours to demonstrate that the Romans were the most excellent people on earth. He endeavours to show that it was the primeval right of the Romans, insofar as would have been possible in their day, to conquer the whole globe. He endeavours to show that victory over the whole globe by the Romans was a greater right than, for instance, the right of independence of individual small, na small nations, for as he says, it was God's wish that the Romans should rule over individual small nations for the good of those individual small nations. Dante quotes many proofs out of the spirit of his time for this justification for the Romans to rule the globe. One of those proofs reads as follows. The Romans stemmed from Aeneas. Aeneas married three times. His first wife was Crusa. Through his marriage to her, he had won the right to rule over Asia. Secondly, he married Dido. Through this marriage, as progenitor of the Romans, he had won the right to rule over Africa. And then he had married Lavinia, thus gaining the right, that is for the Romans, to rule over Europe. When speaking about this, Herman Grimm once remarked, in my opinion, not without some justification, how lucky that America and Australia had not yet been discovered. Well, for an enlightened intellect of Dante's day, indeed for the most enlightened intellect of Dante's day, the conclusion drawn was perfectly obvious. At the time, such a discourse amounted to a legalistic declaration. So now try to imagine any lawyer of the present time presenting a conclusion like this. You cannot imagine it. And similarly, you will be unable to imagine with regard to other matters that a train of thought such as Dante's 
could arise from the soul makeup of a present day individual. From this very obvious fact, we learn how to view the metamorphosis of human soul configurations. Such things are now incomprehensible, but until quite recently they were in some respects still acceptable. Now they are no longer acceptable and they will in future not be acceptable, although up to our time, or at least until the end of the 18th century, things began to change after the French Revolution. Humanity did still possess certain instincts, certain remnants of those soul configurations. From those instincts it was still possible to develop a consciousness which upheld the soul. But the ever-developing organism of humanity has become such that these instincts are no longer present so that human beings must now work in a more conscious way towards understanding the coherency of humanity as a whole. This surely constitutes the whole significance of today's social question. What people now say often amounts to no more than partisan formulations, but what surges in the depths of the human soul cannot be expressed in such formulations. What surges there is what humanity feels, namely that one must consciously seek what binds the individual to the whole of humanity, which means that one must adopt a social impulse. But one cannot do this without seriously taking a comprehensive view of the law of evolution. So let us do this once more, having already done it repeatedly in respect of other questions. For example, let us look at the period from the 4th post-Christian century up to about the 16th post-Christian century. Here we see Christianity spreading across what was then a civilised Europe. We find that this spreading out can be characterised as we did yesterday and on other occasions. We find that during this period great care is taken to comprehend the mysteries of Golgotha on the basis of all human ideas and concepts stemming from Greek culture. But then a changed form of development begins. We know that in fact it commenced somewhat earlier, around the middle of the 15th century, before becoming fully visible in the 16th century. That is when thinking based on science begins to take hold of the upper echelons of humanity before becoming ever more widespread. So now let us look at this thinking based on science with regard to one specific characteristic. There are many such characteristics which can be applied to scientific thinking, but today we shall focus on one of these. Namely, that if one is one of the stalwart, newer thinkers in today's sense, one cannot cope with the distinction between natural necessity and freedom. Today's thinking based on nature has increasingly seen the human being as a part of the rest of nature, which is conceived of as a stream of firmly interlocking causes and effects. Of course, there are also many individuals today who understand clearly that freedom, the experience of freedom, is a fact of human consciousness. Nevertheless, this does not necessarily prevent one from also coping with the configuration of thinking based on nature. But if one thinks in the manner required by today's natural sciences, then one cannot combine the idea of human freedom with this thinking. Some make life easy for themselves as regards human freedom and a human sense of responsibility. I know a criminal lawyer who always began his lectures on criminal law by saying, Gentlemen, this lecture is about criminal law. Let us begin by adopting the axiom that human freedom and human responsibility do exist. For if freedom and responsibility did not exist, there could be no criminal law. But criminal law exists since... That is what my lecture is about. Thus, responsibility and freedom exist. This argumentation is somewhat simplistic, but it does indicate how difficult people today find the question, how can natural necessity be combined with freedom? This shows, in other words, that owing to developments during recent centuries, human beings have increasingly become confronted with having to think about a degree of omnipotence in natural necessity. They do not say this in so many words, but they do bear in mind a degree of omnipotence in natural necessity. So what is this omnipotence of natural necessity? It will help us to understand one another if I may, may remind you of something I have often mentioned. Thinkers today imagine that they are acting, or rather thinking, 
without prejudice and solely in a scientific manner when they claim that the human being consists of body and soul. It is so, is it not, that people right up to the supposedly great, actually great only thanks to his publisher, philosopher Wilhelm Wundt, think that the human being must consist of body and soul, if indeed even the soul still continues to be seen as valid. Only diffidently does the idea of the human being consisting of body, soul and spirit dare to show its face. Philosophers who nowadays believe unquestionably that the human being consists of body and soul do not realise that this division is nothing other than the consequence of a historical event which was initiated by the 8th General Council of Constantinople during which the Catholic Church abolished the spirit by declaring the dogma that a properly pious Christian must think of the human being as consisting of body and soul with the soul possessing certain spiritual characteristics. This is what the church decreed. And philosophers still teach this today without realising that they are merely following the church's dictates. They believe they are teaching philosophy impartially. This is today the situation with regard to a good many instances of what people call non-judgmental science. The situation is similar with regard to natural necessity. Overall, development from the 4th to the 16th century worked increasingly on a specific concept of the divine. If we look at the fine detail of intellectual development during these centuries, we see, arising out of human thinking, a quite specific concept of God, a concept of God which culminated in the statement, God the Almighty. Only a few people know that prior to the 4th post-Christian century, it would scarcely have been meaningful to speak of Almighty God. I'm not referring here to the truth proper pounded by the catechism, which of course speaks of God the Almighty, God the All-Wise, God the All-Good and so on. These are things that have nothing to do with the realities. Prior to the 4th century, no one with any understanding of these things, who really followed these things, would have considered regarding Almightiness as a fundamental characteristic of the Divine Being. In those days, what still held sway were the residual effects of Greek concepts. When thinking of the being of God, one would not, in the first place, have said, God the Almighty. One would have said, God the All-Wise. It was wisdom which was initially attributed to the divine being as his fundamental characteristic. Not until the 4th century did the idea of omnipotence gradually begin to enter into the concept of the divine being. And this then continued to develop. The concept of a personage was abandoned. It became increasingly an attribute of a merely natural, indeed a mechanical order. So the more recent concept of nature, the almightiness of nature, is nothing other than a further development of the concept of God from the 4th century and right on into the 16th century, except that the attribute of a personage was discarded so that the concept of God became instead an attribute of nature. Today's genuine natural scientists would of course object strongly to such a statement. In the same way, some philosophers believe they are without prejudice when contemplating the human being as consisting solely of a body and a soul, although they are actually parroting the 8th Council of Constantinople of 869. Just as these philosophers have become dependent on a historical trend, so all these scientists, the Hackelians, the Darwinians and all the others, right up to the physicists with their natural necessity, are merely dependents of a theological current which has been developing since Augustine and right up to Calvin. We must begin to see through this. It is characteristic of every evolutionary current that it involves some kind of evolution, but also an involution or devolution. Thus, while the concept of God the Almighty was developing, an undercurrent also existed in the subconscious realm of the human soul, which later became the overcurrent, natural necessity. And since the 16th century, a new undercurrent has been present, which in our time is now preparing to become an overcurrent. It is this which we have to cite as the characteristic feature of the Michael Age, 
The fact that something which was prepared in the form of an undercurrent of natural necessity must henceforth become an overcurrent. One must comprehend the inner spirit of earthly evolution if one wants to reach any kind of serviceable concept regarding what is really being prepared. As I pointed out the other day, earthly evolution, and specifically human evolution, is of its own accord moving in a downward direction. Earthly humanity, indeed earthly evolution itself, is in decadence. I told you that even today it is a geological fact which serious geologists submit that the Earth's crust is in a process of decay. But more particularly it is humanity itself which is in a process of decay caused by sense perceptible earthly forces. So humanity must proceed in such a way that it will become capable of absorbing spiritual impulses which work against the decadence. That is why a conscious spiritual life must enter into humanity. We must make clear to ourselves the fact that we have already passed the highest point of earthly evolution. For earthly evolution to continue, spirituality must be taken up ever more clearly and distinctly. This may sound like an abstraction, but for the spiritual researcher it is most certainly not an abstraction. As you know, through the Saturn, Sun and Moon stages, we can follow the development which has continued on to become the Earth stage. When speaking of modern humanity, we can also describe this development by saying that the Saturn, Sun and Moon periods were preparations, initial stages leading up to modern humanity. On the Earth itself, the human being has only now attained his full humanity by taking in his eye through which he will bring ever further aspects into that humanity throughout subsequent development phases of the earth. As you know, the beings whom we know as the Archai, today's spirits of personality or spirits of time, were, although with an entirely different appearance, at the same stage of development in the Saturn period as we human beings are here on earth. In my books I've expressed this by saying that the beings we now know as Archai, as spirits of personality, were human during the Saturn period, the Archangeli were human during the Sun period, and the Angeli were human during the Moon period. And now, during the Earth period, we are the human beings. Of course, we always also joined in with our own preparatory form of development. By going back to the Moon stage, we find that the Angeli were human beings then. Of course, they did not look like us, for the conditions on the moon were quite different. But apart from the Angeli, those moon humans, we too were developing to quite a considerable degree towards a preliminary stage which was so advanced that even then we might have been mistaken for Angeli. Especially when the moon stage was already in decline, we became quite a nuisance for the Angeli. And now, in the earth stage, we are in a similar situation because as the Earth stage declines, other beings are following on. This is a significant and important result of spiritual research which must be taken very seriously indeed, namely that in the present stage of the Earth development, other beings are making themselves felt who will have reached their human stage on Jupiter, the next stage of earthly evolution. They would have reached the human stage in a form which, though different, will be comparable with the human form. We ourselves will be different beings on Jupiter, but those who are virtually Jupiter human beings are already here, just as we were already there at the moon stage. They are here, even though they are not outwardly visible. I mentioned the other day what it means to be outwardly visible while also being a super sensible being. And super sensibly, those beings are very much here. Let me emphasize yet again. It is a most serious truth that certain beings, who already surround humanity, are beginning to assert themselves. They have been asserting themselves more and more ever since the middle of the 15th century. Initially, these beings, having mainly been developing the stimulus for a force which is very akin to the human will force, about which I said yesterday, that it resides in the deeper layers of human consciousness. Those invisible beings who are already asserting themselves strongly in the development of present-day humanity are related to what as yet exists unconsciously in today's ordinary consciousness. 
This amounts to a tremendous problem for those who take spiritual research entirely seriously. I was faced with it especially strongly, as I said at the time, in one way or another, to a number of our friends. I was faced with this problem especially strongly in 1914 when that catastrophe of the war broke out. One had to ask oneself, how could an event, immeasurable in its causes to a degree which would be incalculable with regard to any other event in history, come rushing in upon the humanity of Europe? For those who know that scarcely more than 30 or 40 individuals were involved in the decisions of 1914, for those who know what the sole constitution of most of those individuals was, the most significant of the problems was that most of the individuals involved, strange though this may sound now, were in a state of clouded, of darkened consciousness. In fact, in recent years a great deal has been taking place which was influenced by a dulled consciousness among human beings. We see at all the decisive points of time in 1914, and especially at the end of July and the beginning of August, how the most important decisions were taken in a state of darkened awareness, and this has been going on right up to our time. This is a terrible problem. Looking at it through spiritual science, we see that those darkened states of awareness were the portals through which those beings of will took hold of those human beings' consciousness, of that consciousness which was shrouded, enveloped in darkness, in order to work with their own consciousness instead. And those beings who took possession of our consciousness and who are as yet subhuman, what kind of beings are they then? This is a question we must ask in all earnestness. What kind of beings are they? Well, we've inquired after the origin of human intelligence, after the origin of intelligent human behaviour, of which the tool, put simply, is the organisation of our head. As we saw, this intelligent constitution of our soul originated in the deed of Michael, the archangel, which is normally depicted symbolically as the fall, the casting out of the dragon. This is actually a rather superficial symbol. If we properly imagine Michael as the dragon, we should imagine the being of Michael, and in addition, the dragon, which is everything that enters into our so-called common sense, our intelligence. Michael casts the opposing hordes not into hell, but into our human heads. From then on, this is where the Luciferic impulse has lived. I've already described human intelligence actually being a Luciferic impulse. So we can say that, in looking back over the coming into being of the earth, we find the Michael deed, and bound up with that Michael deed, the illumination of the human being with his reason. And what then arrives? Those subhuman beings whose chief characteristic is an impulse which very strongly concords with the human will, with human willpower. These come up as it were from below, whereas the hordes or powers cast down by Michael come from above. And whereas the latter took hold of the human capacity to think, the former latch onto the human will. They unite with it and are beings generated by the kingdom of Araman. It was the Aramanic influences which worked through those shrouded consciousnesses. Indeed, so long as those influences are now treated as objective forces in the same way as the forces present in the world, now known as magnetism, electricity and so on, are treated, so long will no insight be gained into that world of nature to which, according to Goethe's prose hymn, Die Natur, the human being also belongs. For actually, Nature, as it is conceived of by present-day science, does not dwell in the human being, but only in his physical outer shell. These beings, which represent a rising up of the Aramanic essence analogous to the casting down of the Luciferic essence at the beginning of earthly evolution, these beings who also consist in a power which influences the human will, just as the other beings influence human thinking, must be recognised as having entered into human evolution. We must be clear about the fact that these beings are arriving and that we must reckon with a certain concept of nature, which, however, initially only applies to the human being since the animal kingdom only entered into the earthly era later and can therefore not yet be influenced by them. It will not be possible to comprehend the human race without taking these beings into account. These beings are being pushed as though from behind, 
the actual aromatic force which gives them their strong willpower and influences the direction of their actions and so on is what lies behind them. These beings which in themselves are subhuman beings are dominated en masse by higher aromatic spirits and they therefore have within them something which reaches far beyond their own nature and essence. There is something in the way they manifest which if it captures the human being can work more strongly, even more strongly than is possible today for the weak human being unless he has gained strength through the spirit. What is the goal of this horde? You see, just as the Luciferic hordes which Michael cast down are pitched against human enlightenment, against human good sense, so are these other hordes focused on penetrating the human will to some extent. So what do they want? They rummage around in the deepest layers of consciousness where human beings today are still asleep even while they are awake. The human being does not notice them entering into his soul or into his body. But that is where they had the allure to attract everything which is still luciferic through not having taken in the Christ. This is what they are able to capture. These things are extremely relevant today. I've already mentioned one phenomenon which is highly significant in the sense of cultural history. There are plenty of written justifications nowadays. All kinds of people from Theobald Berthman to Jaguar Everyone actually is busy writing. Clemenceau and Wilson will have their turn a little later, but they also will write. Everyone is writing. We need only to have a look, as, as examples, at two large volumes by Tirpitz and Lundendorf. It is highly interesting for someone who thinks along with the spirit of his time to examine the manner in which such individuals as Tirpitz and Lundendorf write. As regards content, they differ greatly. They disliked each other profoundly and had very different views. However, their points of view are not what interests us here, for what we want to examine is their spiritual configuration. Their books are written in the German of today, or what is very like the German of today. But in the way they are expressed, their thought forms, one must have some understanding of such things Otherwise, one would not notice what is going on and would place the books in the present time, merely because they are dated 1919. Their thought forms are written in a way which makes one ask, what exactly is it about this way of forming thoughts? I ask myself this question very seriously, especially in connection with these two books, because it is totally untrue, a real untruth, that they are written in German. Externally they are written in German, but actually they are translations because the thought forms stem from the age of Caesar. The way of thinking in the time of Caesar is present in these two writers. Once one has gained an understanding of the metamorphosis of humanity in the way I described earlier, one notices the backwardness of such souls, for they have remained untouched by the metamorphosis. The memoirs of Tirpitz and Nundendorf are only incidentally about present-day events. They might just as well be about Caesar's campaigns. This can be demonstrated clearly by someone who has the necessary methodology. In other words, Christianity has completely bypassed these two individuals. There is nothing Christian in them. There may be some expressions. Perhaps they prayed in Christian churches during their youth, but I don't know. I don't believe Tirpitz would have done and I'm not sure about Lundendorf either, but that is not the point. There is no genuine Christ impulse in their hearts, in their souls. They are caught in an earlier phase of human development. These are the type of thought forms which can be touched by the spirits I mentioned just now. They can attract them and seize hold of them. It is on this that they want to base their dominion. This is the manner in which an alien element an element from another world of spirit which is trying to gain ground enters into human decision making. In Lundendorf's case it is historical provable even though there is as yet no such thing as a hysteropsychopathology. But there will be soon enough nevertheless in the case of Lundendorf this could be directly proven. It was on the 6th of August the capture of Liege 
The whole army unit was jammed into one street with Lundendorf, still a colonel in its midst. All the decision making was up to him. What happened in Liege was entirely down to his rapid resolve, but his normal state of consciousness was lost at that moment. This brought his soul into a state resembling that of Caesar. His consciousness was dimmed, and this brought about the clouding of consciousness which provides the portal for the Aramanic world. These problems are brought to us by the times we live in. We should no longer ignore such things. It is not easy to cope with them. What is easy is to think in a different way about human beings, namely not to think about them at all, not to encroach too closely upon them. This is not without danger in our present time, when in many of its individuals humanity does not love the sense of truth which makes one speak in full truthfulness about these things, quite apart from the fact that a misunderstood sentimentality can make the soul feel dreadful about them. However, what will result from an understanding like this is a thorough recognition of the need for the Christ impulse. One must know where the Christ impulse is absent. As I showed you yesterday, the Christ impulse must gain a hold in the middle layer of our consciousness. So today we may add, when consciousness of the Christ impulse takes hold in the middle layer of our consciousness, when the human being is truly filled with the Christ, then the aromatic forces will be unable to pass upwards through this middle layer and the forces of the intellect will be incapable of travelling downwards with their spiritual forces. Everything depends on this being the case. It is very necessary that we should today recognise that while there are certain influences which are rooted solely in the human world, there are also influences which come from beings who are outside and beneath human beings and that it is upon these that certain other beings can exercise their influence. Last week I spoke about the Michael influence and I described this Michael influence to you. It is a very necessary influence. For just as much as it is true that the Luciferic influence entered human intelligence through the Michael influence, so it is also true that the polar opposite is approaching through the rising up of certain Aramanic beings from below. Only through the continued activity of Michael will the human being become forearmed against that which is rising up. Already today it is physiologically quite dangerous to rely solely on natural necessity on that kind of fatalism which is expressed by natural necessity. The human head is weakened by being taught in school and being taught by life to believe in ideas which are based solely on natural necessity. Ideas which are rooted solely in the overall might of natural necessity. This will render human beings so passive with regard to their consciousness that other forces will be able to gain access there and thereby the strength will be lacking which is needed to bring the Christ impulse in its present configuration into the sole makeup of the human being. It is my duty at this time to speak about what we have begun to discuss today, and I shall continue with this tomorrow, namely to speak about how certain aromatic beings enter into us, beings with whom we shall have to reckon. All kinds of people on our earth already know about what it is that is entering into our lives, but their interpretation of this is mistaken. Their interpretation is wrong because they do not know and do not wish to know about the true trinity of Christ, Lucifer and Araman in that they lump Araman and Lucifer together. They are then no longer able to make a distinction and can thus no longer properly recognise the true character of these Aramanic beings who are beginning to rise up. It will only be when they can properly distinguish what is Aramanic and how it contrasts with the Luciferic that they will know what kind of supersensible influences are arising which constitute the reverse part of the fall of the dragon brought about by Michael. It is like a rising up out of aromatic depths, like a rising up of certain beings, and these beings will find certain points in the human being which are open to attack if human beings leave themselves open to unbridled instinctive impulses and fail to strive for clarity as to their impulses. There exists today a method or I might also say an anti-method, by means of which one can disguise what is instinctive through rising up a concept and then piling another one on top of it so that it is no longer possible to form a proper judgment about the matter. Just think of the rallying cry of our more modern proletariat, 
As I've often said, this rallying cry is backed by some very justifiable demands for humanity. Yet it is not those demands for which the appeal is made. It is our idea about the free folding of the social order which constitutes the first genuine appeal. However, the rallying cry that is constantly articulated nowadays is Workers of the world unite. What does this mean? It constitutes a call for antagonism towards the other social classes. You proletarians should, as individuals, cultivate something akin to hatred. You should unite in your love for one another and in your hatred for others. Seek the love of one class. Let the love of your comrades arise out of your hatred. Love one another on the basis of your hatred. This is how one sets up two polar opposites, thus causing people's perceptions to become so nebulous that their instincts are suppressed and they no longer know what is going on within themselves. This is indeed a kind of anti-method, if I may use this paradoxical expression. The purpose is to use present-day human thinking to cast a vow over the working of an instinct which provides strong points which are liable to attack by the Aramanic beings I have described.